It's around 4.30 in the morning on Sunday, October 10th, 2004. Three years after his final major league game, Ken Caminiti is wide awake, walking the streets in the Bushwick section of Brooklyn. Even in his playing days, Ken didn't sleep well. He would often be up all night and then arrive at the ballpark early in the day and sleep in the clubhouse until it was time for work. Today, though, is different. He's not up late partying. Instead, he's up early to head from a Brooklyn apartment to his hotel room in Queens. Ken is scheduled to fly home to Houston in the afternoon, and he needs to pack his suitcase. Ken has already made a couple of phone calls this morning, and now he takes out his cell phone and places a call to Rob Silva. He asks him to meet at a local park. It was a chilly autumn morning, with temperatures in the 50s in New York City. When Silva met Caminiti, he found him on edge, depressed, and sweaty. Five days earlier, Ken pled guilty to a felony drug possession charge in a Texas court, ending a nearly three-year legal saga. He was now a free man and was planning on heading to Montana to get clean and sober for good. After a decade of publicly struggling with substance abuse, his closest friends believed that this time he would finally stay clean. But Caminiti never made it to Montana. He never even returned to Houston. On the diamond, there was no pain Ken Caminiti couldn't overcome. San Diego Padres bench coach Tim Flannery called him the Tin Man. He comes in, and he's limping like he needs oil. Two hours later, he's playing nine innings, Flannery said. That's how he leads on this club. Everyone watches him walking in, squeaking, and it inspires guys who have lesser pains. How can you not play when you see Cammy fighting to get in the lineup? Ken Caminiti's reputation as the toughest man in baseball preceded him. With his intense, deep-set blue eyes, movie villain goatee, and the constant lack of a smile on his face, he cut a far more imposing figure than the six-foot, 200 pounds he was listed at. He was an intense competitor, a warrior, and a rare kind of leader who brought the best out of his teammates simply with the example he set. Ken was max effort all the time, and wore his reputation for playing hurt as a badge of honor. He endeared himself to his managers, teammates, and fans, but beneath the facade, he was a sensitive, vulnerable, and caring man. Former Padres general manager Kevin Towers said it best. Ken played like a badass, but he didn't have a mean bone in his body. That sentiment is echoed by all who knew him well. But to know Ken Caminiti well is to know his demons. For most of his life, he struggled with addiction and was never able to win the battle. He had a big heart and was a protector, but he felt like he was letting everyone down. Ken was a three-time National League All-Star, three-time Gold Glove Award winner at third base, and was unanimously chosen as the 1996 National League Most Valuable Player. His 239 career home runs were top 10 all-time for switch hitters when he retired. People inserted his name into popular song lyrics, he starred in a baseball comic book, and was front and center on cereal boxes. Ken Caminiti was a bona fide superstar, and he changed the game of baseball forever. This is his story. Welcome to season one of Secondary Lead, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti. A 10-part series on the life and career of one of the most important baseball players of the 80s and 90s. If you like this show, please click subscribe and leave a rating or a review. And now, Chapter 1, The Tin Man. The extraordinary life of Ken Caminiti came to a tragic end on Sunday, October 10th, 2004, in an apartment in the Hunts Point section of the Bronx, New York. But it began far away on April 21, 1963, in Hanford, California. Kenneth Jean Caminiti was the third of Yvonne and Lee Caminiti's three children. He had an older sister, Carrie, and an older brother, Glenn. Hanford is just under a three-hour drive southeast of San Jose, where the family would move and Ken grew up. They lived on Cordoy Lane in a typical middle-class neighborhood. There, the legend of Ken Caminiti began. He made friends with many kids on the block and developed a reputation as a daredevil. Kenny was fearless and was willing to try anything to push the limits. 
When he was only two and a half, Kenny declared he was Batman and tried to fly down the stairs. He made it, but tumbling. As he grew older, he dove off the roof of the house into the Caminiti swimming pool and did flips off a 35-foot ledge at the local reservoir. In the future, Caminiti would earn the nickname The Gun because of his arm strength. That was on display when he was just 12 years old. A group of kids were taking turns throwing a play softball at a streetlight, trying to break it. Kenny picked the ball up, walked to the other side of the road, and threw it as hard as he could, striking the light and smashing the cover, which remained broken for nearly 20 years. His father was an army veteran who landed a job at Lockheed in San Jose, working on secret classified programs. Lee was a tremendous athlete growing up, playing baseball, basketball, and football in high school, and basketball and baseball in junior college. He even played some semi-pro baseball afterward. Lee had only a few rules. You don't quit what you start, you don't dishonor your government, and you don't complain when you break a bone. He kept his sons hungry by never letting them win. If they were going to succeed, they had to earn it. After his Major League debut in 1987, Ken cited his father as the person he attributes most of his success to. He's been pushing me since I was little. According to Lee, Yvonne had the highest pain tolerance in the entire Caminiti household. If there was an accident, she didn't complain. She'd just slap a band-aid on the wound and move on. Glenn Caminiti is also responsible for developing his younger brother's toughness. The two played football together at Lee High School in San Jose. Glenn was a ferocious middle linebacker for the Longhorns, while Ken, two years younger, started defensive back. Even in practice, Glenn went full throttle, to the point where his coach would have to ask him to hold back until that week's game so he didn't injure anybody. Ken saw that and simply wished he could be as tough as his big brother. Glenn was both admired and feared by his peers, who stepped aside if they saw him coming down the hallway. They knew better than to get on his bad side. Ken idolized his older brother and tried to be just like him, but the two had very different personalities. Glenn was self-sufficient and an intimidating protector, while Ken was, in his own words, timid and shy. When they played, Glenn made sure to be on the opposite team so he could rough Kenny up on the field. But if anyone else went at him, Glenn stepped in as his protector. Mark Sweeney was Caminiti's teammate with the San Diego Padres and now serves as a broadcaster for Fox Sports San Diego. Him as a teammate, um, it, it was very understood. He was going to go out there and play. He was going to give you 100% of what he had. Uh, there were times that you knew he wasn't 100% and maybe our team might have been better with somebody that was a little more healthy, but he wouldn't let that. It, it was it was the way he drove himself, and I think it had a lot to do with uh, the way he was raised. Football was a way for Ken to escape the timid side of his personality and cast fear aside. Like many American teenagers, he found alcohol to be a cure for his shyness as well. Late in high school, early college, I started meeting friends, going out drinking. You're not scared of nobody when you're drinking, Ken told ESPN the magazine in 1998. One year, Kenny broke his hand early in the football season and missed several games. As the annual Thanksgiving rivalry game approached, Yvonne took him to the doctor for a checkup and he was told that he wouldn't be able to play because his hand was still healing. On the way back home though, Kenny was smiling. His mom asked why and he told her of his plan. Glenn would help him with a splint and tape and he would play that week anyway. He eventually convinced his coach that his hand was only bruised. As a senior, Caminiti sprained his neck trying to make a tackle. It was slow to heal, and Ken had to wear a two-inch neck roll in the postseason California Prep All-Star Senior Football Game, a game in which he re-injured his neck. At that point, football was over for Ken. In addition to the gridiron, Ken also played basketball and baseball in high school, following in his father's footsteps as a three-sport star. A natural right-hander, he learned to switch hit, and as a sophomore in 1979, Caminiti hit 420 as the shortstop for the Longhorns and began to attract attention from several NCAA Division I programs. He set the tone early in his career when he went 5 for 5 in his very first game as a member of the varsity team. In addition to playing shortstop, Kenny also pitched for the Longhorns, taking advantage of his rocket right arm. He threw the ball so hard that some teammates didn't want to play catch with him because it would hurt their hands to receive his throws. His batting average dropped 50 points in his junior season to 370. By his senior year, it was only 332. 
I think I was pressing too hard, trying to make too many things happen, Kamenetti said of his high school career to the Orlando Sentinel in 1985. One can speculate that Ken's mounting football injuries may have played a role in his spring performance on the diamond as well. Despite his athletic success and efforts to create a tough guy image for himself, Kamenetti did not lose his soft side. His parents shared with Bleacher Report the time that an acquaintance was hit by a car and survived, but suffered scarring injuries. Ken took it upon himself to walk the boy to and from his classes and became his protector from bullies who would pick on him. Despite the intimidating, tough-as-nails persona he cultivated, those closest to Ken remember the side of him that was generous, kind, and selfless. A side that you would never see just from watching him play baseball. Brad Osmus was a teammate of Caminiti's with San Diego in the mid-90s. You know the funniest thing about, for me, the, the funniest thing about Cam here, the, the, one of the best things about Cam was, mm -hmm. he had this big goatee, um, very intimidating looking. You know, piercing eyes, uh, but really a big teddy bear of, of sorts. But you can never quite get past the fact that when he's staring at you, and then there's a, there's a very slight difference between when he's smiling and when he's angry. <laughs> it's a little disconcerting. If you didn't know him, he could be smiling at you, and you'd, think, you'd swear he's, he's about to slug you. In the ninth grade, Ken began dating Nancy Smith. The couple dated throughout high school and college and eventually married in 1987. He was fiercely loyal and went to battle for his friends and loved ones. If you were Kenny's friend, he was a ride or die, there by your side through thick and thin. His relationships with friends and family were the most important thing in his life. Cammy was just very, he was very giving. He didn't really, he, he felt like the friendship was more important than the few hundred dollars he might spend that night. The, I should say the friendship and the camaraderie. That was more valuable to him than money. He is legitimately someone that, if you call in the middle of the night, said, my car broke down two hours away, he would come get you. Caminiti's senior year at Lee High School was a trying time. Injuries ended his football career, and Glenn was involved in a motorcycle accident which left him wearing a back brace. Ken's baseball scholarship offers had disappeared, and so he had to go to San Jose City College, where he walked on to the baseball team. Ken clashed at San Jose City College with head coach John Oldham. Oldham was an old-school baseball man who had started San Jose State University as a left-handed pitcher and played professionally in the 1950s, reaching the major leagues with the Cincinnati Reds in 1956. He was a longtime coach at San Jose City College, eventually leaving in 1985 to take a job as the head coach at Santa Clara University. There he led the Broncos to four NCAA tournaments and won four West Coast Conference Coach of the Year awards before his retirement in 1997. Oldham insisted that Caminiti should give up switch hitting and only bat from one side of the plate. As Ken eventually established himself among the all-time best switch hitters in MLB history, that coaching advice seems misguided in retrospect. Merv Rettmond was Caminiti's hitting coach in the major leagues in San Diego and Atlanta and explains why some hitting coaches discourage kids from switch hitting. Like, I don't particularly like to coach switch hitters. I just don't see much value in it. And the thing is, if you're a switch hitter, you're going to the weak side, the left side, so many times more than you are the right. Eventually, it becomes your strong side, but your natural side is always your right side. So what you end up with is a guy that right-handed is long and strong and can hit the ball a long way, but his swing is longer, and left-handed, a guy that's a pretty good hitter. Line drive, more line drive hitter but I don't think that they can't keep both of them sharp all the time. Caminiti was so upset with being given this advice, he thought about quitting the team. His father talked him out of it by saying he wouldn't support Ken if he didn't stick with baseball. We don't know how seriously Caminiti was considering quitting baseball at the time. It could have just been an empty threat, the kind that 18-year-olds are known to make. But if it was serious, this was a stitch in time that forever altered the course of baseball history. He played the 1982 season as a non-switch hitting shortstop for the San Jose City College Jaguars, and as many college ball players do, played in a summer wood bat league afterward. There, he returned to switch hitting, and he wowed coaches with his power from both sides of the plate. One coach who was particularly impressed was Gene Mangus, 
who offered Caminiti a scholarship. At the time, Mangus was the head coach of the San Jose State University Spartans, just four miles from SJCC. He was a World War II veteran who graduated from Anaheim High School on June 6, 1944, and enlisted in the Navy on that same day, which was more famous for being D-Day for the United States in Normandy. Mangus was deployed to the South Pacific and eventually achieved the rank of Quartermaster 3rd Class before he was discharged in 1946. After his service, he was a star football player at San Jose State and was an assistant football coach for 17 years for the Spartans before taking over as the head baseball coach in 1969. He led San Jose State to the NCAA tournament in 1971 and an impressive 40-win season in 1978. In his 18 years as head coach, 34 of Mangus' players were taken in the MLB draft. After star pitcher Mark Langston was drafted by the Montreal Expos in 1981, the 1982 season was by far the worst of Mangus' baseball coaching career at San Jose State. The team won just 14 games and lost 39. Mangus was determined to change the course of the program for 1983, and he did just that by bringing in Caminiti and a host of other new players. But there was one problem for Ken. After playing shortstop his entire baseball life, he had to move positions. San Jose State had an incumbent junior shortstop in Tom Kraus, a speedster who led the team in stolen bases. Caminiti played some left field in the early part of the season before settling in at third base, his ultimate baseball home. Dana Corey had been the starting third baseman for San Jose State in 1982 and had played with John Elway growing up. I was a starter as a junior at third base. We came out for our senior year for the first practice and there was myself and the guy that was my backup the year before and then this kind of transfer kid from uh, San Jose City who was transferring as a sophomore and, you know, quiet, didn't really say too much and, you know, coach had threw my backup a ground ball and he made the play and he hit me a ground ball and I'm like, okay, all's good, you know, nothing's changed and then he hit a ball down the line and, and this kid backhanded it and got up and threw an absolute howitzer across the diamond like I had never seen an arm like that other than Elway like it was like something out of this world and my eyes got really big and after practice and this is a true story after practice I went up to the coach and I said hey man I can play second base too <laughs> and so I played second base my my senior year and, and you know Kenny was our, our third baseman San Jose State trounced Cal State Hayward 12 to 3 in its 1983 season opener and on the first weekend of the season, met the Stanford Cardinal for a three-game series. The Spartans pulled out a 3-2 win in the Friday night game, and two days of rain postponed the regularly scheduled Saturday doubleheader to Monday, February 14th. On Valentine's Day, Caminiti made Spartans fans fall in love with their new star. I remember a time when we were playing Stanford, Mangus told the Daily Spartan, San Jose State's student newspaper in 2001. They had a right-handed pitcher on the mound, so Ken decided to bat left-handed. He hit the ball over the oak tree in right field. Later in the game, they came back with a right-handed pitcher, and he hit the ball into the soccer field from the right-hand side of the plate. After the game, a fan sent the SJSU baseball program $100, with a note attached to it which said, that is the type of baseball I like to see. We played a game again at Stanford, and, uh, and Ken, uh, Ken hit that game, he hit a home run right hand and left hand, I remember that. But mm -hmm. the second, there was a pitching change. So we're in the dugout after the inning, after the half inning, and I'm like, uh, hey buddy, what'd you get? And he goes, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, what, what pitch? What pitch did you hit out? What, I mean, what does this guy got? He goes, I don't know. Hmm. I'm, like, I'm like, wait, really? You know, he was just playing wiffle ball and I was grinding it out. I mean, that was just how it was. Like for him, the game was, it was a lot simpler because he was so gifted. Caminiti also tells the story about homering from both sides of the plate in a game against Stanford, but that never actually happened. At least, not exactly. According to the game story from the Daily Spartan in 1983, Ken did in fact homer from both sides of the plate in one day against Stanford, but the feat occurred in two games. He hit his first home run in game one of the doubleheader, and his second was a go-ahead homer in game two. The passage of time could blur memories, and that's probably what happened here. Importantly, the essence of the story is true. 
Caminiti had made his mark at San Jose State. The Spartans raced out to an 18-6 start, led by Caminiti, who was still batting 400 a month into the season. But as April approached, the Spartans went into a team-wide slump. They lost seven straight games, including an embarrassing five-game sweep at the hands of defending conference champion Fresno State. In that series, San Jose State was outscored 46-9 and couldn't do anything right. By May, things were looking up for the Spartans again, but Caminiti's average had dipped into the 280s. At season's end, Ken hit 299 with seven home runs, both second best on the team. He led the team in doubles, triples, and RBIs, and finished first or second on the squad in five other offensive categories, as the team finished 32-20, and 20, the last of six 30-win seasons at San Jose State under Gene Mangus. Heading into the 1984 season, Mangus had high hopes for the Spartans. He was direct in the Daily Spartan season preview when he said, I think the key will be Caminiti. However, in the second game of the season, those plans took a hit. With San Jose State trailing by a run at the University of California at Berkeley in the top of the eighth, Caminiti was involved in a collision at home plate with Cal catcher Bob Liebsit. Ken was knocked down, but suffered a shoulder injury that Mangus feared was potentially season-ending. It turned out Caminiti had separated his left shoulder. He was tortured watching from the stands as the Spartans' offense struggled in his absence, but after missing only seven games, he returned to the field. Pain from the shoulder injury lasted for years. As time went on, Ken self-medicated and used alcohol and prescription painkillers to numb the pain. Chris Donalds was Caminiti's backup with the Houston Astros in 1993 and 1994. He had had kind of a bum shoulder that I, I think in college he had told me, I think he had a collision at home plate with a catcher somewhere and it really tore up his left shoulder. You know, he played with a reckless abandon that, uh, you know, a lot of guys didn't. So he kind of he paid the price for that a little bit as far as just durability-wise. The San Jose State Spartans of 1984 had a partying streak, one which led Mangus to discipline four players for breaking curfew as part of four separate incidents. One player, outfielder Mark Triplett, was dismissed from the team. If Caminiti was involved in any of these incidents, he was never publicly disciplined for it. Ken was a member of the Sigma Alpha Epsilon fraternity and did party, but nothing he did went beyond what anyone else was doing at the time. There were no signs that he had any problem that people noticed. The Spartans struggled on the field and had just five wins, 13 losses, and one tie at the time of Triplett's suspension. But following the suspension, the team immediately went on an 11-game winning streak as Mangus provided the team with a wake-up call that it needed. To compensate for losing Triplett, Caminiti was once again moved from third base to left field. Jeff Crace took over at third. Ken told the Daily Spartan how the team was playing better since the incident and added that they were playing less selfishly and more as one cohesive unit. In the 11th win of the streak, Kevin Eddy was front and center in an epic comeback against the University of San Francisco. With the game tied at six and Kevin Eddy on board at third, Mark Saucedo hit a soft roller to USF first baseman Larry Arrington. Arrington scooped the ball and gave Kevin Eddy a look before turning to touch first base. The second Arrington turned, Ken dashed toward home plate and was more than halfway there by the time Arrington realized what was happening. He didn't even make a throw, and the Spartans went on to win 7-6 on Cammy's daring dash. San Jose State third base coach Chad Roseboom said he'd never told Caminiti to break for home and noted that it was the best base running he'd seen in a while. Ken's baseball IQ was developing and he was realizing that a career in baseball was a possibility for him. I didn't really know how good I could be, but I figured I had a chance of making it professionally, he said to the Daily Spartan after his 1987 MLB debut. I thought about it a lot. I went to college to play baseball. That was number one. I was a business major, but the classes weren't so much the reason I went as was to play ball. Right before the 11-game winning streak began, Caminiti made big strides toward a pro career. San Jose State traveled to Pasadena for a series with the University of Southern California. The Trojans featured future home run king Mark McGuire and future Hall of Fame pitcher Randy Johnson and were one of the best teams in the nation under head coach Rod Dato. San Jose State went down to USC to play a series and Ken just tore them up. And Dato was like, who the hell is this guy? technology wasn't the same like you wouldn't a guy like Ken Caminiti could kind of fly under the radar yeah people in the Bay Area knew who he was 
but on a national level, not really. And then he went, and then he went down there, and I guess he just went off. He just did what Ken does, but he did it in front of a big time guy, and and uh, and that's kind of what you know got him really, uh, really on the map. The 11 game winning streak was ended in convincing fashion with a 13 to six loss to UCLA, and the Spartans started a slide which saw them finish the season by losing 23 of their final 35 games. The team was plagued by an ineffective pitching staff and injuries, including one to Crace, which led to Caminiti shifting back to third base. Ken was just about the only thing going well for San Jose State that year. He finished his junior year with a team best 348 batting average and led the team in hits, runs, doubles, triples, home runs, and RBIs. He earned second team All-American honors from the Sporting News and established himself as a prime target to be drafted in the 1984 MLB Draft in June. The 1984 June Amateur Draft was loaded with talent. As Ken Caminiti awaited to hear his name called, the event began with the New York Mets selecting Sean Abner, a high school outfielder from outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, with the first overall pick. The Oakland Athletics selected Mark McGuire with the 10th pick. In round two, the Chicago Cubs drafted Greg Maddox, while the Atlanta Braves snagged lefty Tom Glavin. The first third baseman to be drafted was Luis De Los Santos out of Newtown High School on Long Island. Another high school third baseman came off the board in the third round when the Cincinnati Reds took Chris Jones, 59th overall. Brad Pounders of the University of California Riverside was picked by San Diego with the 65th pick. Leading up to the draft, the Caminiti family was hearing that the Texas Rangers were high on Ken. They had a family friend who was a baseball scout and was pushing Texas to take Ken, and Lee was convinced his son was going to be a Texas Ranger. But with the 66th overall pick, the Rangers selected Sid Akins, a pitcher from USC who had never reached the major leagues. Texas never got another chance to draft Ken. With the 74th pick in the draft, the Houston Astros selected Ken Caminiti. There were 48 third basemen drafted in 1984, and only seven of them ever made it to the major leagues. De Los Santos played in 55 career MLB games, but only two of those at third base. He posted a career wins above replacement, or war for short, of negative 0.9. Chris Jones had a nine-year big league career as a journeyman outfielder and never played a single game at third. He played for nine different teams and accumulated 0.4 career war. Scott Livingstone was drafted in the sixth round by the Toronto Blue Jays, but didn't sign. He, along with Chris Jones, would eventually be a teammate of Caminiti's in the mid-90s with the San Diego Padres. Milwaukee's 14th round pick, John Jaha, put up 12.4 wins above replacement in a productive 10-year career as a first baseman. He only played two-thirds of an inning at third base in his entire career. 20th round pick Gene Larkin won two World Series championships with the Minnesota Twins and posted 1.6 wins above replacement in a seven-year career. He played three games at third base. Tim Gillies was a 47th round pick of the Yankees and played in two Major League Baseball games as a pitcher in 1990. Ken Caminiti posted 33.5 wins above replacement in his 15-year MLB career and played 1,676 of his 1,760 career games at third base. All other third basemen drafted in 1984 combined to play just 325 games at third, with all but six of those by Scott Livingstone. Years later, after Caminiti made the major leagues, he gave Gene Mangus a large color photo of himself, which the coach hung proudly in his office. On it, Caminiti inscribed, Coach, thank you for getting me to the big leagues. Mangus laughed. Hell, I didn't have anything to do with it. Ken signed a contract with the Houston Astros on June 9th, and his professional baseball career began, but with a caveat. After impressing Rod Dado by tearing up the USC Trojans pitching staff, Caminiti received an invite to be a member of the 30-man USA Olympic baseball team in 1984. On the next episode of Secondary Lead, the rise and fall of Ken Caminiti. Ken's time with the 1984 U.S. Olympic team comes to an end. He gets off to a lightning-fast start in the Houston Astros minor league system 
and 40 miles north of San Jose in Oakland, California, a 20-year-old slugger from Cuba named Jose Canseco makes his Major League debut for the Athletics, and baseball's steroid era begins in earnest. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast and leave a rating or a review, and spread the word by telling a friend. Follow us at Secondary Lead on Twitter and Instagram, like our Facebook page, and check out show extras on YouTube. Music is courtesy of PurplePlanet.com and the YouTube Audio Library. Our theme was written and performed by Jim Montgomery and Chris Cottrell. I'm your host, Joe Basile. Thanks for listening.